Hi everyone and welcome along to Sonic Academy with me, Chris. Today I am chatting with a producer who is based in Bournemouth here in the UK. He used to produce the darkest of drum and bass under the guise of G- DJ Dose and now produces the dirtiest of dubstep on Dr. P's Circus Records. Would you please welcome to one to Sonic Academy, the one, the only, Funk Case. How you doing there? Are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What's going on? How are you? Yeah, I'm all good, mate. How you doing? Thank you very much for joining us on Sonic Academy today. Uh, wanted to get to chat to you uh, about your sound, where you are in 2016, uh, some of the tracks you've released and how you uh, make stuff in the studio. Let's start by chatting about your new single, which has come out. Uh, when, when did that come out? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it came out this year, didn't it? It definitely came out this year. I think it came out last month. Last I month, yeah. Yeah. And is this is this been your first single in a while? Is, has, was there a little bit of a break in 2015, or yeah? So from some from around 2013, I've kind of uh, I've been almost uninspired um, through the sound of dubstep, just because a lot of the stuff sounded the same. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy for me to to say oh, I'm going to cr- you know fill a hole in the scene, but it just I just wasn't uh, enjoying anything I was making, and uh, I basically just sat myself down and knocked myself away and tried to improve my production value, try and make myself a better producer in you know for mix downs, mastering stuff like that. So uh, I basically just locked myself away, did all that, and then uh, yeah, just came back, uh, just came ran up doing a load of collaborations with producers to get my inspiration back, and uh, yeah, it's all just run from there really. It, it definitely I mean it's a problem when you talk to. I've done a few of these interviews and it does happen that people do sort of run dry and just the creative juices dry up and you're in a scene that, you know, tends to not very much move on. Bizarrely, one of my later questions was there is definitely a big production jump from your last EP, Don't Piss Me Off, into uh, Netbreaker. You can just hear that it has just gone through the roof and, and I take it this is the result of you locking yourself away? Yeah, pretty much. Um I've I've been speaking to a lot of producers to try and get a few handy tips on what I can and can't do in you know my production because I was before I was sort of relying on ozone mm-hmm. to do a lot of the work for me which is obviously a very lazy thing to do but uh, yeah it just it kind of I didn't realise I was doing it but at the time I was relying on it so heavily and decided to just you know break myself down and just re almost reinvent how I produce uh, and do all my stuff and just um, yeah just up my game a lot really and that's uh, the result. And when you say you were relying on ozone, was it to was it kind of I'll fix that in the mix, just you know leave it, or trying to you know trying to mix within the mastering part of the process, or, or what way were you relying on ozone? Yeah, it was it was it was more relying on uh, mixing, you know, using ozone to mix my track for me. I was I was uh, I'd start an idea and then uh, it wasn't sounding, you know, obviously as produced as as the end result would of a track. So. Uh, I, d- I didn't know how when it started or what happened, but uh, I put ozone on it. It sounded great instantly, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, okay, cool." And then by the time I'd finished the track, I'd be struggling to make the mix sound great at the end of it. And you know, it was obviously because ozone was doing all the work, and I was trying to basically I was just fighting the ozone with everything I was doing inside the track. And uh, yeah, as soon as I released "Don't Piss Me Off," I think it was I don't know. I think I think um, I was speaking to Doctor P, and he was telling me about. Um, how bad Ozo can be if you rely on it, and yeah, it basically just sort of. I just sort of something clicked in my head, and I just that was it. I just sat in the studio and just re- and reinvented myself, basically. Cool, that's good. And um, what what did you reinvent? What was the big in the last two years? What has been your biggest takeaway? What is the the thing that that you have learnt that has just you can hear it in Netbreaker. It's just it sounds phenomenal. So what is the what's the single biggest thing you've achieved? It's more about um, the, the details. I'm not quite sure where I learned it from, but I've been doing a lot of scalpel EQing of you know removing in tracks and a lot of harmonic boosting rather than you know big range cue boosting. So um, it's been a bit more uh, detailed and, and finely tuned when I do my mix downs. And I'm not, again, I, I couldn't tell you where it came from, but uh, I've been fighting to have more of a warmer sound, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. from speaking to a guy called Joker. But uh, he uses all hardware, so to achieve what he does is almost near impossible. But I've been fighting to sort of have a much cleaner and more warmer sound since then. And yeah, this is kind of just on the way to my path, really. Let's go back to 2007 and sort of just get a a bit of a place where you came from. You started in drum and bass. Did you come from kind of a heavy metal drumming background? Am I correct in saying that? That's right, yeah. Yeah. before before all of this electronic music business, I was <laughs> I, I had hair down to here, and I was listening to 
pretty much the heaviest death metal I could find at the time. And uh, one day, uh, well, my mum, my mum is a DJ, and she used to be uh, quite a well-known DJ in the Happy Hardcore days. <laughs> so okay, right, 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 brilliant. She was always a DJ from when, from the, the moment I was born up until the moment I decided to like, you know, drum and bass. And uh, the the defining track was uh, Bandwagon Blues by Twisted Individual. Yeah, yeah. I heard that in my mum's deck dex room as she was uh, doing a mix, and I was like, "Whoa, that's that's pretty cool, actually." And then that one track was what changed it all. And hair came off. It started to like drum and bass. Started to make it, and yeah. And and had you any production from being in bands and guitar bands? What was the process familiar to you, or was it when you decided to make drum and bass? Was it? I don't know what a sequencer is. I don't know what a DAW is. Was it a clean start, or had you been around that world with your mum and stuff? Yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was pretty new, to be honest. My mum was more of a... She wasn't really a producer, she was more a DJ, because obviously back in them days, DJs did well, and producers were kind of the... You know, they weren't really noticed, so... Mm-hmm. Um, it was completely new. It was it was more just messing around on music on the PlayStation um, that I sort of familiarised myself. And that was just for fun. That wasn't because I wanted to make music. And then that turned into Reason, uh, working with Propellerhead, uh, propeller sorry. And... Uh, that is in turn, after you know becoming quite serious in music with reason, I ended up moving to Cubase just to sort of expand my uh, way of production. And I want to ask you about Cubase because it's not really the the door of choice for dubstep guys, which is usually probably FL or uh, as you say reason, you know, with with Cookie Monster and and other people. So why why what led you to Cubase? Um. A few of the guys already on Circus, like Flux and Doctor P, were actually already using it. Okay. So, uh, and and Trolley Snatcher as well, who was uh, well known in dubstep at the time on um, Dub Police Records. He was he was he was actually living in Bournemouth, like quite new. And um, I was still using Reason when he first came, but as soon as uh, he moved to Bournemouth, I used to go around his house a lot, and uh, he was showing me how to use uh, Cubase Nuendo actually, mm-hmm. which is like sort of the video making one, I think. I don't know. It was kind of kind of weird, but. Um, I just decided to, that Reason was too uh, limited in what I could do in it, you know, because it's, it's just whatever's in Reason is all you can use. You can't really bring anything else to the table if you wanted to play with a free VST or if you wanted to buy Massive, you couldn't use it unless you had a, you know, a rewire option, which for me was too complicated. So yeah. um, I just decided to just th- um, throw away my hard years of, <laughs> my hard seven to eight years of working with the Reason and just um, and just take the plunge. And although it was, took a long process, it was definitely benefited me. I think it's pretty so th- let's talk about Bournemouth this, in in the late noughties. You know, it it was traditionally a kind of trancey town with uh, slinky and stuff. So what's what was the drum and bass and dubstep scene like back then? Was it like, active? I mean, in the early days, drum and bass was still you know it was still coming up. Um, there was a night called Coco Shabine at the Opera House. I think yeah. that was the same place as where Slinky was. And then uh, uh, I think um, that was I- the back room, wasn't it, of Slinky? Yeah, very yeah, bossy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Such a mix of crowd, you know. You had all yeah. the tr- the fluffy transfers out the front and the and the crazies in the back. You know. Yeah, what's new? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. and then um, I don't know. Really, I don't really know what happened to Coco Shabine, To be honest, that sort of uh, fizzled out. Um, I wasn't really involved in it. I was uh, too early in the scene to be involved in something like that. So, um, and then uh, when dubstep came about, as you can probably imagine, the whole of the UK latched onto it, including Bournemouth, and there was a million promoters trying to do the same thing. But uh, there was always one standout night, and that was a night called uh, Dubnium, which is now known as Dub Optic, which is still going, but right. it's, it's less it's less events. But uh, it's probably the biggest one at the moment, and probably was back then. Just booking anything from uh, Cyrus to Hatcher to N Type up to Doctor P to myself to Flux. So yeah, it was mm-hmm. a big trip. And your sound very much is it's the big American sound at the moment. You know, do you find? Do you feel very protective of the genre in the UK, or is it kind of? Do you like being that sort of uh, left of field genre in the UK? Do you like? Do you like that sort of position? No, I'm I'm very UK. Um, I'm, I mean, I've I've been on tour a lot in America, and I hear a lot of the American dubstep a lot, and it, it just uh, <laughs> is getting very dry right now um, mm. in that sound. So it's very hard for me to enjoy um, what's been played over and over again. If that makes sense. But. I kind of uh, at the moment I'm kind of, um, you know, try, still trying to apply my UK sound, but to to an accessible edge with the Americans because obviously there's American dubstep which you can quite clearly hear, but there's there's UK dubstep, but Americans seem to for some reason latch on to the American dubstep a lot easier than the UK one. I might be wrong, I don't right. know. Uh, it seems to be you know the wave of American dubstep suggests that Americans are latching onto that style a lot more. So 
trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm still me. I'm still, everything's still me, but I've got, I've got an edge, which, you know, is accessible to Americans. And obviously that's good for me career wise, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't ruin anything I'm making and, you know, my, and my general sound in general. Would you, I mean, would you say that your dubstep sound is, is a lot edgier, a lot darker, a lot, you know, I mean, there definitely there's tracks where you verge on, you know, heavy metal and stuff, you know, but then there, you flip it with tracks like Borg, you know, the opening to Borg is, synth wave to me it sounds and do you enjoy that sort of mashing up of different genres and, and sort of nailing it the, the dubstep sound yeah to an extent i mean i've been, I've been quite into uh, writing orchestral pieces which is where the intro for neckbreaker came from and um same with borg really borg is a, is a synth it's sort of a synth composition if that makes sense you know yeah. uh, virtual writer is amazing at doing those but it's kind of pretty much where i'm at as well with, with intros and stuff trying to start with a with a um, huge atmosphere and then work into a drop and you know it makes the impact bigger it sets the scene you know so um that's yeah that's pretty much all i've been doing really <laughs> I, I, no definitely when you go through borg and you go through uh other tracks like power now and stuff you can definitely hear that you're playing with those different styles for the the intro and then you know slamming in the hard drop uh collaborations you i mean is you're in a pretty pretty darn good studio there in Bournemouth. It's I've had a look online. If you can go, you can catch you doing uh, some Steinberg sessions. I think it is uh, yeah. on on YouTube. I mean, you've you've UAD stuff. You've got some nice outboard. Uh, do you rely on outboard, or is it all in the box? It's mainly in the box, but I try to use outboard as much as possible, just because I've been brainwashed by Joker that hardware is obviously better, which obviously it is. Yeah. But- it, it gives you a cleaner and more rich sound, so I'm trying to apply as much as possible um, anything outboard as much as much as I can. Like intro wise, I'll use my my Juno Di or my Roland Gaia, um, just because the sounds that come out of there are so so clean, really. You know, mm-hmm. but I mean, the VSTs are, are just almost just as clean. Yeah. You can almost not tell, but there's a warmth to uh, outboard that you can't really achieve in box. So uh, yeah. So I take it like you're. What is the main synth? Is it going to be the obvious massive that's doing all the dubstep wobbles? Is that your main go-to wobble synth? Yeah, massive has been my my main go-to. I've been trying to dabble with serum, but I can't get anything that's not already been done. To be honest, like there's there's you can hear serum these days. Mm-hmm. You can just hear what a serum uh, synth sounds like. There's only a few really people that are doing anything different with it, really. So uh, yeah, I go to massive and then I try and do anything I can to sort of get a different distortion sound out of it got some outboard um, guitar pedals that I, I put them through and things like that so it kind of gives it a different edge I was going to, I was going to suggest well, what do, what do you do for? I mean obviously distortion's kind of uh, integral to dubstep so how do you keep your how do you keep it different is it, is it pr- export uh, externally processing with guitar pedals or do you always are you always looking for different uh, distortion plugins and stuff what's what's is there a secret weapon distortion plugin not really. I mean, I play with those guitar pedals. I use Camel Crusher. I use uh, Fabfoot or Saturn. I don't really use anything too uh, crazy or you know unknown. I use everything the same as everyone else. But yeah. I'm not really much of a sound designer uh, compared to someone like Virtual Riot on Borg, who did all the sound designing, and I just had my you know my cheeky sounds in the middle. Um, it's just more a case of uh, processing it in different ways, in different orders, and it gives you different sounds. If you watch my Future Music Mad uh, tutorial, there's actually a noise that just goes. Vroom. And it turns into a sort of noise, and that's just from uh, just uh, just you know setting a phase with a flanger and the distortion in a certain order. Mm-hmm. So it creates that noise over over the the very simple uh, synth, and yeah, it's just it's just more uh, playing around with the processing, really. And is that something you would spend a long time doing? Is it sitting processing and reprocessing and repro- and then do you save these as you know channel strip chains or, that you can call up at other times, or is it always start fresh? Uh, no, it's always start fresh, always. Um, unless unless there's a project that's given me any anguish for some reason and I have to back it up, I'll save the trick to strip. But from then on, it's literally it's just every every synth. Even if they, even if to someone they sound the same in the track, I've definitely made it in a different way. So uh, yeah, cool. The, the the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is one a couple. Of, I can't remember which track it is, but yeah, again, your wobbles. You know, they're doing these rapid LFO, which is the dubstep sound. But what do you print this this the the wobbles off to to audio to get the the timing tight or is this are you leaving it to uh, automated LFOs or what, how are you getting that sound so tight the the the, the timing of the, the tracks? Um, automating uh, a lot of the LFOs inside of uh, say massive 
Um, I like to actually, sometimes I like to mix it up. Sometimes I'll have a wobble that's on the grid or I have something with a bit of a delay, just to give it a bit of funk. Mm -hmm. um, that funky delay is kind of my thing, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to do like both ends, but it's more, it's more in massive. You can move the, the LFO to, you know, to be slightly later or slightly later or uh, slightly earlier. So I'll always play around with that to see what comes out of it. But sometimes that can affect if I've got two different LFOs playing at the same time, I move one LFO slightly across and it will just change the sound. So yeah. So, so you don't you don't print off the audio. You, they're they're running as live, sort of as as plugins. Let's move on to uh, the all important drum sounds uh, in dubstep. Do you have kits built, or do you just have a bank folder of snares, kick drums, hats? How do you do you drag in? I'm go I'm going to ask you about four questions here, Mom. <laughs> Let's start with one. Do you have kits built, or how do you do? You work with audio, or do you work with uh, like samplers? <clears throat> um, I work with audio because that's that's Cubase's way really I mean obviously we can use samples but um, I've been working with audio pretty much from the start so I've just been doing it that but uh, I don't have any set kits that I work with every every set of drums is different really and there's, there's only really one set of cymbals that I have either as an atmospheric or the main set of cymbals because it's my cymbals you know? I can get away with something I made as my own sound but when it comes to kicks or snares or anything like that, it's all it's all completely different. Um, so yeah, if, sometimes they might be good, sometimes it might be bad, but that's just that's part of the process, I guess. And, and a, as a, a drummer, is, is is the drums the very important part to you? Do you spend hours sitting? You know, some of your tom fills are pretty darn intricate. You know, they're pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Being a drummer, obviously, that helps. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm very anal about my um, about what sounds I use and the transients inside of it and the clicks and the kick and the, the kick match and the snare as far as the, tra as the transient goes and things like that so it's a blessing and a curse at the same time so what would you what sort of how would you tame transients or bring transients out how do you what's your sort of drum chain um I mean transients wise I use the Sony Oxford transient shaper I think it is I forget what it's called but it's uh it's, it's very it's either very critical or very soft you can use it in other two ways it's, it's uh really good for bringing out the snaps in in any kicks and uh, snares and it's really good for gently removing it without getting rid of the initial snap itself so um yeah it's my goes it's all and i see you've got the rather lovely uad apollo do you have a, a lot of the uad plugins or are, are they a big part of your sound or are they just are you, is it something you've been building over a few years because you know it's quite expensive to to, to get them all yeah, um, no, I, I bought the UAD and I and I tried a few demos and uh, I'm only really working with a few things right now. I'm working with a Neve preamp. Um, I'm working with uh, a Dimension B plugin and a few EQs and the uh, I think it's the Ampex ATR 104. I think it's called. It's the uh, it's the tape machine. The the uh, real the real one. Yeah, the real one. Yeah, so yeah. I'll put that on on maybe my, my master chain just to smooth it off and uh, yeah, just just those things really. But. I find the UAD, I found the UAD kind of uh, slow because my for some reason mine takes a while to load each plugin and it almost ruins my workflow when I'm trying to just you know just trying to churn out an idea and I'm trying to smooth it off and make it sound good at the early stages. So okay. I've, I've started working with something called uh, Slate Digital um, as their as their master bundles are insane. I, 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 do you know I've heard nothing but I haven't tried it out myself but I've heard nothing but brilliant reports about Slate Digital you know and yeah. I think it's really interesting what they're doing the uh, subscription model and get all the plugins and you know I think that's a really interesting concept whereas <clears throat> somebody likened UAD to a, a drug dealer sitting outside your school <laughs> they send you these little 20 pound vouchers every six go on here go on you know buy yeah. another one go on buy another one and you, 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 you drop another 200 quid on, on some plugin you don't need but yeah I use the Ampex myself. I absolutely adore that. I use the the RM16 reverb uh, and the, the the EQs and stuff. What what do you do on your master chain now that you've removed Ozone? Do you still use the the tail things off and just uh, adjust it, or are you, have you a completely different sort of setup now? My to be honest, my master chain consisted of about seven conflicting EQs. <laughs> 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 Instead of trying to do everything in one EQ, I yeah, would yeah. one small thing in one, and then the next layer would be a next small thing, and it would all be. But uh, in the end, that kind of was detrimental to my sound. So uh, um, that mix of ozone was not good. But now I've stripped it down completely. Um, I'll do nothing in my in my master EQ now, apart from remove the the very bottoms, um, you know, below twenty two hertz ish, mm -hmm. and just eighteen to twenty k. Um, and then I'll just do maybe the Ampex uh, tape reel, and then uh, finish it off maybe with the with the FabFilter Pro MB, just to give it, you know, just to make sure everything's as clean or everything's to sound right. And then, yeah, that really. and would you make 
would you produce with that on and sorry you're mixing into it or is that again uh, once you finish the track then you add that stuff in um the only thing i do is the uh, is the eq bottom and top chop um apart from that I, I i make sure that i leave i don't touch my master until the very end really when i come into the final mix <sighs> What plugin could you not live without? We'll give you massive. What's you have to go to a desert island with a laptop, copy of Cubius. You have massive. What other plugin could you have? What would, would you have to have on your desert island? Uh, does it have to be like a bass making synth, or can it be an EQ or anything? It can else? be anything you want. Oh, uh, FabFilter Pro Q. Is Pro right. Q. Sorry, yeah, that would that is my baby. I was told by uh, by Noisia um, to use that. E- and if noisy say something you listen basically <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, noisy seem to be the gods that everything you know every time they say something everybody goes oh this is how we do it they just know they just know what what uh i mean they they are if you listen to anything they make everyone's just in the awe of everything they finish off with so um yeah if they, if they give you advice you're gonna listen i'm in awe of their studio i don't know whether you've seen photographs over the last year they're building this ridiculously huge studio somewhere uh, oh, really? in europe with with all the sprung and floating floors and stuff so yeah it's, uh, i mean if it's the same one they've been building for the last few years i've actually been in them and there's three of the same one yes that's big the, house. yeah i've been in there yeah it's crazy you walk in uh, yeah and it sounds like your voice is like in your face here. It just doesn't. There's no echo whatsoever. It's it's almost like it almost drives you insane after like ten minutes of being. But it sounds insane in there. And what and what about your studio? Do you? I mean, is this somewhere you spend a lot of time? Are you one of these guys that would sit there at two o'clock in the morning, or are you quite regimented in sort of arriving at a ten, finishing at five, six? You know what's? Um, I just I I try not to let my my hobby of you know my love of making music to be uh, work by regimenting myself because then I'm forcing myself to, to do stuff and mm. forcing is you can't get creativity from forcing yourself to do it really but I mean personally myself I can't so I tend to just so you know I wake up when I feel like it so that you know I'm, I'm fresh I don't set my alarm after sleeping four hours and I've sat in a studio just like a zombie trying to work out what I'm doing I'll, I'll wake up whenever I can and then um, if I'm feeling it I'll go straight to studio if I need to wake up I might play like an hour of PlayStation Go to the studio and literally just work till the creativity stops. You know, I could be in there till nine in the morning the next day. I could be, I could be in there for two hours. You know, so I just let the creativity do its thing and and just and yeah, just try and let, let it naturally flow. And you're in a space that you can work away overnight, blasting away, and nobody, you're not disturbing anybody and stuff. That's yeah. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in, I'm in some uh, big unit um, with lots of units in. So um, it's just a whole bunch of uh, studios within that, and uh, there's there's a flats attached to it that they can't hear what we're doing. So we literally, it's just people in studios. So if they're, if they're it's, I mean, I've got next door. I've got Ulterior Motive here on um, Goldie's label, Metalheads. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've been playing earlier. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we we all know what we do. So if we hear each other, you know, all we can hear from that wall, let's say, I can only hear bass. So as soon as um, as soon as I turn my music on, it's drowned out and gone. So. And does that help being in this sort of creative environment where, you know, you can walk down a corridor and meet somebody that's doing, and you go check this out, and oh, have you checked this plugin out and stuff? Is that that's a, that sounds like a really cool thing to be involved in? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, we don't really uh, we talk a, a bit about production actually, but not too much. It's mainly when we go for coffee runs. Right, <laughs> actually, okay. there's, a, there's coffee shops around the corner, so it's only really that at that time. Otherwise, it's just normal. It's normal friendly chit chat, but. If we're walking past, um, if we're walking past our door and we hear a cool tune that they're making, I'll probably I'll knock and go, "Oh, that's kind of sick." And then you know they've done the same for me, and it, that kind of helps. It gives you a bit of a boost, really. Uh, what, what happens if nobody knocks your door for about two months? You're going, "I must be making <laughs> shit stuff." I quit. I quit and I go work at Tesco. <laughs> uh, let's move on to DJ. Uh, you have done some amazing gigs, uh, EDC, and you've got you've just announced you're doing EDC in Las Vegas. How's how's the DJ thing going? Is it uh, is it something that you thrive upon or is it something that you do because you're producing or um the, okay so the whole producing thing has kind of turned into a very important aspect of my of my uh, career actually mm-hmm. from starting off in a guy as a guy in some weird looking mask to putting a hat on the mask to doing a few crazy movements to turning into this whole crazy dude on stage it's just evolved and it's become a real steeple of my of my um my career as fun case basically mm-hmm. so it, i i'm sort of honing my um my entertaining uh ways on stage and uh that's just turned into into what it is now and i've you know i've, I've embraced it massively and i want to make it bigger and bigger do you turn it with putting the mask on does it turn you into a persona so you can go on stage and you you can become 
the font case then is, is that how it works yeah pretty much yeah i'm not like i'm what you see now is like a quiet sort of happy dude and i'm nothing else pretty much apart from stressed if i'm playing playstation but okay <laughs> Punch but, like, screens. Yeah, yeah exactly but uh if i'm if i'm on stage i, I have this regi- uh, sorry this ritual where i put uh, the mask on 10 minutes before my set and i just sort of tell everyone to just sort of stay back a bit not not because i'm dangerous or anything because <laughs> i want to get into the zone because you just let one off <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly um, so i just kind of i kind of get into the zone and um yeah, I just sort of, you know, just my face washes and then I just start turning to this guy that's like some crazy dude who beats his chest and he's like doing all this crazy stuff. And that's not me, but for some reason I have that energy in me, which I which I perform with when I put the mask on. So, uh, yeah. And does that sort of, I mean, it sounds like that performance take, would take a lot out of you. It's, I mean, it's very physical, it's very demanding, it's very hard, you know, and with doing the flights and stuff. Is it something that you find, you know, it is bloody hard to, to keep going? Yeah, I mean, I've just come off the back of my neck breaker tour with Dirty Phonics and Abstract, which was one and a half months long. Yeah. <laughs> and it was all flights, and I think we did 28 shows or something like that. And doing doing what I do on stage for an hour for 28 shows over the course of a month and a half just damn near killed me. So it's good to have some rest. But yeah, it's, it's hugely, hugely taxing. But I, to be honest, like, I can't mind. I've got the best job in the world. So. Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and I take it there's lots of partying in between all this. I mean, there's this sort of... Dubstep seems to be the 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 punk of dance music. It seems to be the real party. You know, it's not sort of it's not a beat the glamorous and stuff. It seems to be you know in your face. Yeah, to an extent. I mean, I don't I don't party myself. I'm <clears throat> I'm a turn up to the gig an hour before I play, talk talking to say hello and network, uh, do my show, and then as quick as I can, I'll try and get out of there. If I have to meet fans, I'll do that beforehand. But uh-huh. I'm not partier at all. I've never I don't drink at shows, so I've never never touched a drug in my life anyway so i've not really been a part of myself but okay but yeah it's i just i'm a, I'm, I'm a workaholic really I, li- I like to turn up and make sure that uh i, I smash it because I'd, I'd much rather play an amazing show where i'll get rebooked than go there and have fun with drink you know because yeah. if, I, if i drink mess up the show i keep I, th- I might think in my mind oh that was a great show and then i'll never get booked there again and you know that doesn't help my career whatsoever no matter how big i get so uh, that's exactly where I messed up. <laughs> so, oh, really? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no uh, so uh, do you produce on the road then? You're, you're talking about your workaholic, so would you go back to the hotel, be inspired and start breaking out the laptop and, and making beats and stuff? Or is it tour is tour, studio is studio? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't want it to be that way, but tour is tour and studio is studio. Okay. I've, I've really tried to make tracks on the road and I really, I just genuinely can't. I've no. tried so many tracks and I've probably come home with maybe two. Yeah, and actually worked on them. I'm doing one now, of, and it's a it's a liquid drum and bass track. So it's like the opposite end of the scale for me as a product as a producer. But I don't know. I, I just can't seem to uh, vibe on the road when I'm touring. You know, with with headphones on, they can never be loud enough. You know that sort of stuff. So uh, it just doesn't help. You mentioned though you're doing liquid drum and bass. So the drum and bass side of things is still an ongoing thing that you would do. You're not. You're not. Oh, so, and would you do that under a different name <laughs> or the font case name? No, it's all on the front case. It's just uh, it's just something I've always been. Uh, it's always been in my heart, and I've always enjoyed to produce it. You know, but it was a stage in, in my early fun case career where I released pretty much no DMB because I was concentrating so much on dubstep, and because I'd spent all my time learning how to make dubstep, I'd almost forgotten how to make DMB. And then there was a point where I started making a few tracks, and then um, there's there's been a couple recently that um, are doing really well in in say Jump Up. Uh, DJ Hazard's playing them. Um, Andy C's been playing my Requiem remix and uh, just a few things like that. So the DMB thing's going well. So I want to keep I want to keep um, you know driving on with the with the with the drum and bass. And uh, I was at a weird crossroad where I didn't know where whether I should make a side DMB project and call it something else. And um, I was speaking to Chase and Status, and they told me just put everything in the front case. Um, people understand. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. Stop that really. And could you be ours having another social network to update another Twitter, <laughs> another Facebook, another you know all these I'm people. Pretty- would- there's, there's days where I'm touring and I can be pretty annoying on social network and there's days where I'm chilling at home playing PlayStation with my girlfriend and I won't do any social networking at all. So, you know, I've got a weird balance. So the, the last thing I need is another... Exactly. You just want to do one tweet and send it to every account that you have, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so 2016, what's coming up? You've obviously got the big show, which is uh, EDC Las Vegas. What, what else have you got planned for the rest of the year? Um, I've got a few festivals lined up. I've got Electric Zoo. Um, I've got Imagine Festival. Um, Glastonbury. Playing, yeah, I'm playing Glastonbury. Yeah, yeah, yeah for first time ever. Um, it's going to be in a small tent in the corner, but you know what? I'm, it's a, it's a tick off the list. So mm. uh, yeah, and I'm playing. Um, 
Ooh. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it actually yet, but I'm playing another UK festival. Oh, I'm playing Bra- a Brownstock Festival. That's a, that's another one. Okay. Um, that's for the Chrissy Chris stage. Um, I'm playing another big festival, but I don't actually know if I've been announced yet. So I'm gonna have to keep that I'll one. keep that one quiet. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it off her and I'll post it on social media. Don't worry. About that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I suppose the last question, it is the most important question uh, we have to ask, is I saw it on your Facebook. How the hell are you playing PS your PS4 on your Mac laptop at, <laughs> while you're away? I want to know. It's PlayStation like, PlayStation just just invented this uh, remote play feature that you can download for the Mac or PC, yeah. and you literally stream your PlayStation to your Mac. And, and it's it's, it's not. A, it's literally it's literally something they've made, and it, all you need is uh, at least eleven megabyte um, internet. You can yeah. play it, and there's there's like a very small latency. It's amazing. <laughs> just sounds like. And what can you use the PlayStation controller or using the keys yeah. on the Mac? Yeah, no, you use the PlayStation controller. It's plug and play. You plug the wire into the USB and it's straight in. So you plug the USB controller into your Mac. You hit connect. Connect your. Does your PlayStation at home have to be on? Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to leave your PlayStation on. Oh, okay. on rest, it's got rest mode, so okay. you leave that on, and it's that sort of on a standby. And then as soon as as soon as the internet tells it to turn on, it will turn on, and then your screen comes up on your on your Mac, and you've got your PlayStation at home. Isn't technology just amazing? <laughs> Honestly, but that's that's that was like when I was touring and stuff. That was my dream was to have. I wanted to play Grand Theft Auto on you know three on on the road. That would have been the happiest guy in the world. But and now you can do it, eh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used to take my PlayStation Four with me. I had I had three PlayStation Fours at one point. Don't ask why. Um, but <laughs> I used to take one of them with me on tour, and it was great. But it was the setting up and take putting it down and put, keeping it in my in my luggage, making sure hoping that it won't break or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It's great, but it was yeah. Unless you're spending like a lot of uh, spare time in hotels, then they're not. So that this system works for you, you think it's 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 totally amazeballs balls and and it's, it, you use it loads. Uh, yeah, I mean, I used it a lot at the start. I haven't used it that much since I've been playing Rocket League on Steam. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's that's without latency, luckily. So yeah, oh, perfect. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, that's all I can that's all I can do. The PlayStation Four, the latency, kind of like you know, sometimes you won't care, sometimes you do. So cool. James, thank you so much for joining us on Sonic Academy today and giving us an insight into your world and your production techniques. Uh, guys, there's uh, playlists on Spotify. Go and check out the new single, which is called Neckbreaker. Yep. Uh, a nice happy title there for summery tunes. <laughs> and we expect some new music in 2016? Yes, sir. Yeah, lots of new music coming up. Perfect. Guys, I want to thank James for joining us on Sonic Academy. Thank you for uh, joining us, watching this, and hope to see you all very, very soon.